So today, what I would like to talk about is uh, something different than what we've been doing before. You heard in Yannick's talk that we've been uh, working a lot or increasingly with uh, market squares, like this one, for example. But today, I'd like to take a slightly different approach and focus on something more recent and something that's not been done that much, actually, or not in Flanders anyway, and look at the town's edges. So this is uh, today's presentation, and I'd like to just tell you that this is still kind of work in progress. Uh, some of the, of the analyses are still ongoing, uh, but I'll tell you about these in a little while. So here what you see is uh, the town of Iper, and some of the English-speaking uh, people here might know it as Wipers, where you go on pilgrimage to, uh, to see the last post, to see the, uh, the World War graves. Uh, so the town is located over here, quite close to the North Sea coast. Um, and this is a map from the 16th century, where you can see uh, the first town rampart, or the earlier town rampart, uh, around the town. And on this one, it's not the best picture, but you see uh, the cadastral plan of today underneath the 17th uh, century uh, reinforcements or ramparts. So this is where we are. Um, and we have looked at two sites. They were dug in, I think, 2015, if I'm not mistaken, um, that were in uh, the time that we're interested in, not yet uh, part of this town wall. So there was an actual urban fabric on there. But we do see um, consistency, for example, with this road. So you have to kind of think away this ditch and, uh, and rampart for the time that we'll be looking at in this presentation. So as I said, we have two different profiles and something went wrong with my plans here, but that's okay. Basically, uh, we have section 25, which sits down here. And if you go back to the previous plan, you can see that it's around this area. Um, it's uh, a section through a profile, I'll show it to you in a minute. And then we have another section that sits over here. As you can see, there's still a road uh, running through a current road. There was a road probably uh, back to the 12th century. This is our hypothesis anyway, and that's what came out of the excavations as well. So these are those two sections that I was showing you, and you'll see these a lot again. So, um, so I apologize for all the gray and the brown, but it's just what we have to work with in a temperate climate. And that's what it will be. So this is the section um, that's <coughs> more to the south. This is a section that's alongside the road. And basically, the main questions the archaeologists had when excavating this site was how to uh, understand the dark earth, so the homogenized deposits on site, for instance, this one uh, and this one, and also some of the more homogeneous deposits in the other section. So that was one of the main uh, research questions also is there a difference between these dark earths between the different uh, locations on the sites uh, and then another question were these walking surfaces or what archaeologists hypothesize were work, work, walking surfaces um, that you can see are darker here here and in this picture it's not that clear but again here 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 they could just see them but they were actually quite thin so it was difficult to identify them in the field so those were the two main uh, questions for the micromorphologists. And what I'd like to do for the rest of the talk is just take you through these sections from bottom to top for each location and kind of build up the story through time. So we'll start with uh, our section 25, so the left one. And there we see that in the bottom, this is actually quite special because we don't find them a lot nowadays, is a relic pre-Holocene soil uh, that was created like this, so you see these features, these vertical tongues, and these cracks that were created uh, because of permafrost. So this was quite interesting to find on site underneath a, a town. When we go uh, up, we see a few interesting features. So we're looking at this first dark earth now. This dark earth was found in both of the sections. Sorry, it's a bit confusing, but it's basically the first uh, moment when something is going on. And there we found that actually in both of the locations, the same thing was happening. Um, and we had basically an agricultural uh, topsoil. Uh, and some of the 
evidence we have for this are, for example, these cut marks that you can see in thin section, um, and a lot of bioturbation, of course. Uh, one of the things we didn't get as much as you would expect in a manured uh, horizon was a lot of anthropogenic material, so we didn't have that much evidence uh, for, for example, um, you know, household waste being dumped or anything like this. We had some charcoal, um, and that was pretty much it. Uh, and actually, in this part, what we would like to do is have an additional analysis of the phytolith in thin section to determine which types of crops uh, were kept here. So this is the first part of the site, and this is currently not dated very well. So I can't tell you exactly when this is happening. Um, the first thing I can tell you, or a bit more in a bit more detail about dating, is when we get to this first dark lamination. And this is only in the, uh, the location of section 25. So now we'll be looking just at this one location, and then we'll move to the one closer to the road uh, in a bit. So what is going on here? Uh, basically, what we see in this part of the thin section, which is about, uh, let's say, this is about one centimeter and a half, um, we see kind of a succession of alternating lenses of charred material and, um, and more clean sandy sediment. So you can see this here, a darker lens, a lighter lens, darker lens, and basically this part is full of that. Uh, with very distinctive compositions. And we, what we also see is a horizontal orientation of all of the components um, and also traces of trampling. So we've uh, interpreted this part as uh, indeed a walking surface, but we could say more than this. It's not just a walking surface. Um, it's actually a protected environment because all of this is very well preserved. Um, so our interpretation is now that it's an in situ house floor, so a domestic floor. Um, which dates probably somewhere in the 12th century. So this is our first evidence of occupation um, in this location of the site, which is really on the edge of where, where the town was um, at that moment. Um, and in this section here, uh, you can see the charcoal, um, which is quite distinctive and, and occurs a lot in house floors. Um, also of different times, different places. Um, and underneath it, you see uh, the remains of, um, of again, charred remains of uh, plants, but they are all very horizontal, as you would expect. And underneath, we have uh, some partially molten phytoliths, that I can show you here. So here you see the remains of a dendritic phytolith, and here they're all molten through, so that could, um, testify to the use of ash, uh, for example, plant ash, uh, as a floor um, cleaner, for example, or to keep it dry, because we are in a very um, wet general environment in Flanders. Um, so what we have here is basically different parts of a floor. And what we often get here is like a preparation layer that is more sediment rich, where you won't be finding many artifacts, for example, or many um, interesting things even in thin section for what people were doing on the floor, but then in the dirtier parts or in the more charred parts, that's where, if you're lucky enough to have them, that's where, you, where you'll find the more interesting artifacts um, and so on. So we can try to imagine it, for example, a little bit like this. Don't mind the material culture. I just want you to look at the floor. So the material culture is all wrong, but we have this kind of dirt floor that's accumulating, being renewed through time and so on. And on top of this, we get what I just said, one of these preparation floors. So it's possible that in between, um, some of the layers are clean, swept away, and then we get a preparation layer that is very uh, sediment rich, very clay rich. Here you can see uh, the birefringent clay in thin section, uh, and also some reddening. Um, so we could have some in situ uh, burning going on, but it's very difficult to tell to tell because oftentimes, again, these are truncated and a new floor is um, deposited on top or used on top. And that's exactly what happens here. I don't have um, a separate slide, but basically here you have this preparation layer and a very, very thin lens um, of active floor, as we would call it again. So then the next part is one of these famous dark earths, what's going on here. Uh, again, uh, we have a lot of evidence for an agricultural use. So we have a cut mark 
right here. That's a very clear one, again, the bioturbation. And here we are getting a little bit more um, material from clear manuring or clearer manuring. But again, phytolith analysis is really needed to understand it better. So we have probably uh, a crop field on top of this house. So house layers truncated, a crop field on top. What happens next? Again, uh, one of these indoors um, trampled house layers with some um, organic material. And in this case, what we found throughout this whole um, area were these semi-preserved um, continuous bands of wood, of woody tissue. So we are hypothesizing that these might have been wooden planks uh, that decayed in situ afterwards, but th those were actually present. So this is for the first location. Uh, so a wooden floor, this is not an archaeological one, this is my own, but just, you know, so you know, a wooden floor. Now if we move to the next section, and I want to see if I can show you on the big plan. No, I can't. Okay, I'll show it to you on the big plan a little bit later, but we, we're now in a completely, thank you, in a completely different context. Even though they're close to each other, this is not comparable at all. So par apart from this uh, bottom layer, which was used for uh, probably agriculture, we are seeing a very different surface. Uh, and what is happening here? Um, it's basically these four top thin sections that I want to walk you through really quickly. We get three kind of different types of deposits uh, alternating. So I'll just explain these to you briefly and then I'll give you the overview of what was happening. Uh, in the first uh, part we have again a covered surface, everything is quite well preserved, but it's a different kind of activity surface or floor surface than we were getting inside the houses. This is actually much more organic, um, it's anomalously rich in all kinds of organic tissue, so it's wood chips, uh, stems, barks, uh, anything you can get. And here we have interpreted this as either like grass matting or more potentially or more likely um, an animal stable, but an indoors animal stable. What we didn't get uh, was evidence of coprolites, but that's not really uncommon to get in micromorphological studies. We've seen it before in different stables that we don't really get the coprolytic material. We, mo we get more of the, of the plant um, base. So this is the first thing you can imagine. We don't know which animal was there because we don't have any coprolites, but we can imagine different things. Next up, we have a very thick um, layer that truncates the stable, and that again is a preparation layer is deposited by humans. Um, it's um, very sediment rich, and there's not that much going on. But then on top, it gets more interesting, because here it's completely different. Here we are uh, encountering an outdoors area for the first time, um, or for the first time where it's in an active uh, interesting town-like phase. Um, and what is going on here is that we have a gradual input of organic material uh, that is trampled, again, so walking surfaces, but also different types of um, anthropogenic inclusions. And now this, I don't know in how much detail Yannick has told you about the marketplace of Lir, but the closest comparison we have to this kind of accumulation is actually a market square so um, there is some traffic, intensified traffic going on. People are doing things in the area. And what we sometimes also get here that we didn't get in Lier was a uh, small scale dumping of ash. So not just spreading it on the floor, but really dumps in, um, in different phases. And you could imagine this, and I just want to show you the location. This is where it gets interesting. We are now close to this road. So we could imagine this actually as a type of maybe street market or you know a road people are passing through. Um, this is convenient for people to sell things. Uh, so this is uh, potentially how we can imagine it, but with less sun and of course different material culture. We are in Flanders. So imagine this in a drizzly, wet, muddy context without sun, you know, more clouds. Okay, um, so actually we have some uh, renditions of this from Lear, not from Iper from the 16th century, and here you can see you know, how, how it would be potentially busy, market stalls, things falling around. Again, they're drawing it sunny, you should imagine it cloudy. Um, so I'll just walk you through these surfaces because they kind of repeat each other. What we get here is again, uh, small scale dumping of ash, waste material, mostly combustion waste, um, and then 
uh, outdoor area with more fresh organic matter. So we see kind of differences in what is going on, but it stays this kind of uh, heavy traffic, um, outdoor street area for all this time. And then on top here, we get another leveling layer, truncating uh, this dumping. Uh, again, more dump of combustion material. We stay outdoors. And then there is one more thing I want to show you in this um, sequence. And that's the top of the top thin section, where we see something different going on. And I've actually never seen something like this in an outdoors area. So we weren't completely sure if this is actually outdoors or indoors. We get a very thin stratification of sediment and of um, organic lenses, but these are actually continuous bands of wood or bark. So this is looking like very gradually built up um, walking surfaces, and we've counted at least 21. So we think we have at least 21 individual uh, walking surfaces going on. Whether this is inside or outside, that's maybe something for the discussion. Or if you've ever seen something like this, we can talk about it a little bit more, because we do have some channels going through. My time is up, so I'll just conclude with, um, at the end, basically the whole sequence was really rapidly buried, both in section 15 and in 25, by um, just a clean level uh, layer of sediment. And potentially, we could uh, link this to the context of this ditch and rampart formation that you saw in the, in the first historical plan, where things really change in this environment. So to conclude, we have seen two very different sequences quite close to each other in an area that is typically not considered very interesting for these types of analyses. And it's actually well worth studying them. And it would be very interesting um, to compare these much more detailed or better understood sequences to what we're finding in the center of towns. And, and specifically in Ypres, it would be a very interesting comparison, for example, in the 12th century. Uh, also to evaluate agriculture in towns, animal husbandry in towns, you know, different functional uh, aspects. And as I said, we still want to do or need to do some additional analyses. For example, look at the phytoliths in the thin sections to de determine the crops, uh, look at granulometry, and also maybe do some elemental analysis to determine how fertile the soils were and really um, strengthen our hypotheses of these agricultural layers. So that was it. Thank you very much for your attention.